In 1989, residents of a close-knit apartment community in Virginia gathered for a holiday celebration. For Tammy Brannan and five-year-old daughter Melissa, Christmas was always a special time. Then, without warning, the little girl was gone. Her disappearance ignited an impassioned search. Law enforcement and the local community spared no effort. But would they piece together the evidence and find her before it was too late? In 1989, in front of close to 200 witnesses, a child disappeared. Five-year-old Melissa Brennan vanished from a Christmas party at her mother's apartment complex in Virginia. Children have a way of wandering off, but it soon became clear this was more than a case of a lost child. Someone had taken Melissa. What sorrow compares to a mother's grief? What kind of monster preys on children? I'm Jim Kalstrom, former director of the FBI's New York office. The hunt for Melissa galvanized the community as a nation held its breath and waited for word. All victims deserve justice. All criminals must be punished. But when a crime involves a child, the stakes become so much greater. On December 3, 1989, the Woodside Apartment Complex in Lorton, Virginia, held its Yuletide Christmas party. How's he doing? Okay. <coughs> the Woodside was a large but friendly complex, a community that revolved around family life and children's activities. The kids were always excited about the party, which meant special treats and presents. A single mom, Tammy Brannan, had found in the Woodside Complex a safe community in which to raise her only child, Melissa. As the evening wound down, Tammy stopped to visit with a friend before going home. Can I go get some potato chips? Okay, we'll come right back. Okay. She lost sight of her daughter for only a few seconds. But that was long enough for a mother's worst nightmare to begin. disappeared. The Fairfax County, Virginia Police Department was called immediately. I'm going to do everything I can to find your little girl, but you have to tell me everything you can possibly Detective Bill Wilden assured Tammy they would do all they could to find her little girl. The detectives began questioning the people at the party. No one could recall seeing Melissa leave the party or anywhere near the front door. I'm Detective Wilden. This is Rappaport with the Richard Rappaport, the Fairfax Department search commander, joined Detective Wilden to organize the search party. If you come across anything suspicious, an article he would head up the investigation. Does everyone understand? One of the possibilities, of course, there. was that she had just uh, hidden somewhere in the building, was playing with some friends, or had wandered off. So immediately the patrol officers on the scene did a very good job of searching the building and they began a search of the immediate area surrounding the building. The night of December 3rd was a bitterly cold night in the Washington area. Uh, someone outside that was five years old without a lot of protection probably would not have survived uh, through the night. It was that cold. 
I need you outside with flashlights. Rappaport coordinated a more specific grid search of the area with patrol officers and dozens of volunteers from the complex. The search effort began. Nearly a hundred neighbors, police, and army personnel from nearby Fort Belvoir combed the woods around the complex. Most were parents themselves, united by a single concern, to find Melissa. Like the detectives, they expected to find a shivering and frightened little girl lost in the dark woods and crying for her mother. Officers began to question the 200 people who had attended the party and interview over 400 other Woodside residents. Though the complex was large, many residents knew Melissa and knew her to be very shy. Shocked to hear that she had disappeared, almost all expressed doubt that she would ever have gone off without her mother and certainly not with a stranger. Detective Wilden went with Tammy to her apartment to interview her. He questioned her extensively about her past and possible troubles with her neighbors or employer. An accountant, she had never had any problems with anyone. Tammy had lived at Woodside for over three years since her divorce from her husband in Texas. She had experienced the normal readjustments of a newly single mom but she and her ex-husband were on good terms. When detectives discovered an open window in the furnace room, Nobody Jim Gogan, the crime scene investigator for the Fairfax County Police Department, was asked to examine it. The way the door was set up, everybody had to either go through the crowd to get out the front of the building. Um, that was only the main door and the only door available to get out, uh, with the exception of the, the hallway down to the bathrooms and the furnace room. They had large, uh, large windows, and in, in the furnace room itself had a, a, a window that was discovered open. And from there, the assumption was made that possibly that's how she uh, was taken from the building. Melissa's disappearance was suddenly far more complicated. The search for a missing child had become a possible abduction case. Did you see her leave the party at any time? The police continued their questioning with even greater urgency and began to hear repeated mention of the strange, even bizarre behavior of the maintenance man for the complex. Several of the women reported how offended they were by extremely vulgar sexual propositions made to them by Caleb Hughes. There was a possibility that if she had been abducted for sexual purposes that she might be molested, but we were very, very um, hopeful that we could at least find her alive uh, before her life was in jeopardy. Now that they were dealing with a possible abduction case, detectives returned to Tammy's apartment and collected nightgowns, hairbrushes, and bedclothes, any items bearing traces of Melissa. Can you describe As detectives continued questioning the people at the party, they learned more disturbing details about Hugh's behavior that night. He had spent what seemed to many to be an unusual amount of time playing games with the children. He made the parents uneasy by touching the kids. There was something unsettling, something indecent about him. At the party, he was not dressed. Uh, uh, as well as the rest of the people, he wore his work clothes. Um, he mingled with some of the people he knew at the party, and he spent some time talking with Melissa's mother, uh, making comments about Melissa, and offered to take Melissa and a couple of the other children to the restroom if they needed to go. He just had some very suspicious behavior for a, a man of his age around the children. With growing suspicion, the detectives tried repeatedly to reach Hughes by phone and then went to his house, but were told by his wife that she had no idea where he might be. Were you playing with her tonight? He had left the party sometime before our arrival there. He lived only four miles away, but it took us several hours for us to contact him because he had not yet returned home. Finally, two and a half hours after Melissa's disappearance, 
Caleb Hughes called the police, who then returned to his house. Upon questioning, he claimed he had simply taken the long way home. The officers immediately noticed he was wearing different clothing from that reported by witnesses at the party. I washed clothes tonight when I got home. They're in, the, they're in the washing machine over there. In the washing machine, they found the clothes Hughes had been wearing, as well as his sneakers and a leather belt with a knife sheath. The knife was missing. You washed your shoes at 2 a.m. in the morning? Yeah. He'd been gone for several hours, and to come home in the middle of the night when your family was asleep and to feel the immediate need to wash everything you had been wearing, including your shoes, we found that rather suspicious behavior, and that just further added to our our interest in, in his whereabouts. As Hughes appeared reluctant to speak in front of his wife, the officers decided to take him to headquarters for further questioning. Suspecting that Hughes might be covering for time spent with a girlfriend, the officers wanted to allow him the opportunity to tell the real story. Do you know Melissa Brandon? No, I do not. To the detective's surprise, there was no real story. Hughes had no alibi. He claimed he had no idea who Melissa was, that he had driven the long way home Why were you washing your after shoes? picking up a six pack, and then had simply washed his clothes. You normally wash your shoes with your clothes? Sometimes, yeah. What were they dirty with? He said as an excuse that, that were, they were his only work clothes and he had to be to work the next day and they were dirty, so he needed to clean them for work. Look, am I being charged with anything? Despite hours of intense questioning, Hughes remained no, smug right and evasive. I'm free to go. Finally, yeah, Detective to go. Wilden told him he was free to go, but I know you're he was almost certain Hughes was lying. Well, you're going to have to prove it then, aren't you? As far as the Fairfax County Police Department was concerned, Caleb Hughes was the prime suspect. Believing Caleb Hughes was involved in Melissa's disappearance, Detective Bill Wilden contacted Fairfax County Commonwealth Attorney Robert Horan. It was a suspected homicide, certainly by then. He made some statements that, that were out of character for somebody who really you know, is Brandon? a suspect in a uh, crime yeah. of this nature. You would we normally think the, the minute somebody would suggest you or I oh, have a, abducted a five-year-old child, Look, I mean, you would think we, it would be the most vigorous, vehement outburst. Of course I didn't. Well, they got nothing like that. Matter of fact, at one point he said to, uh, he said to Wilden, prove it which is, uh, again, a, an unusual reaction for somebody who had nothing to do with it. Gogan had photocopied Melissa's picture and printed hundreds of flyers to help in the search. And as the sun came up, the, the search expanded um, into you know, further down south on the highway. Uh, they sent soldiers out to do uh, uh, massive searches through the woods, along the railroad tracks, and, and as possible ideas of, of locations where she might have been were developed, again, um, hundreds of people were, were uh, gathered to search and walk those areas. The car Hughes had been driving that night belonged to his wife. She gave investigators permission to impound and search it. Detectives examined it for fingerprints, blood, fibers, hair, any evidence that would document Melissa's presence there. Fingerprint tests revealed that only the Hughes family had left prints on the car. Next, all the hairs and fibers needed to be collected from the interior. This type of trace evidence was usually retrieved with a vacuum cleaner, but there was simply too much debris inside. When I first approached the car and looked inside, I, I just kind of went, whoa. Uh, they had two large dogs to use. Um, they carried them a lot in that car. They were, it was just cluttered with dirt and debris and, and just just a mess inside that car. And, and I just kind of shook my head like this was going to be a, a real challenge. So I decided to, uh, to, to use the masking tape 
as an alternative to the vacuum cleaner, just hoping to uh, just get what was on the surface. That was an unusual technique, certainly. Um, in, in my years, that was the first time I ever had run into it uh, in the Fairfax uh, Police Department. And uh, it's, it's a very common technique now. Gogan then placed the tape between layers of clear plastic so that it could be examined intact under a microscope. As the car processing continued, Melissa's disappearance quickly became the lead news story in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Melissa Brannon is three feet tall, 48 pounds with blue eyes and dark blonde, shoulder-length hair. She was last seen wearing a pink ski jacket, red plaid skirt, and black shoes with gold buckles. The night of the party, Melissa had been wearing a navy blue acrylic sweater with a Sesame Street Big Bird picture, red tights, a red cotton plaid skirt, and a pink parka. Uh, when I found the red and blue fibers that were visible on the tape, I, I did kind of get uh, excited about that. But at the time, I was excited but worried because we needed to find her to, to identify uh, the clothes, the, the possible clothes. Without Melissa, that was going to be real tough. When Gogan conducted luminol testing on the interior of Hughes's car, he found traces of blood on the steering wheel, brake pedal, and floor mat. When a light is shined on the luminol-treated area, blood stains will appear fluorescent. While the luminol process is quite accurate as a blood locator, it can also destroy the genetic characteristics of the sample. When I sprayed the steering wheel, I got the reaction on the steering wheel and as well as on the, on the pedals of the vehicle, that's where the, it, it fell to. Um, these items were swabbed and, and collected. Hughes's shoes had been washed but the lab was able to identify possible blood stains on their soles where fresh cuts had been made. It became very suspicious when I received the clothes from the, the officers who searched the house and noticed that he had uh, cut his tennis shoes. Um, kind, of, kind of putting two and two together that why was he cutting his tennis shoes and why did I get a reaction to blood on the gas bottles? Surely Caleb Hughes had tried to cover his tracks to avoid a link to an unimaginable crime. What is your name? Caleb Hughes. How old are you? With the luminol findings showing blood in his car, the detectives were increasingly confident they could get a confession from Hughes. He was brought in for a polygraph test. He had no explanations for the fresh cuts on his shoes. No. Once again, he gave no explanation for the two hour, 30 minute delay in getting home. But as it turned out, there never was an explanation. He said, I just took the long way home. That was the best they got. Did you harm Melissa Brandon? No. Did you kill Melissa Brandon? No. These are proven to be deceptive. When Hughes denied outright that he had killed Melissa, Holograph examiner Rick Danielle was sure he was lying. He really denied ever having seen this child, denied knowing who the child was. He was showing pictures of her, never seen that child before. And of course, the police knew that was not true because he had been at the same table with the child, had talked to the child. You got the wrong guy. I'm asking you about what you did. You got the wrong guy. Danielle was absolutely satisfied he was hiding something, that uh, he was lying about something. I'm out of here. He was attempting to deceive him. But of course, none of that under Virginia law, uh, as you may know, none of that's evidence. Uh, you're not allowed to use it at trial. Investigators were convinced Hughes had abducted and harmed the beautiful little girl. But Tammy Brannon tried to keep her hope alive, fighting her worst fears. Melissa's Christmas presents waited under the tree. News 7 has confirmed tonight that the investigation into the disappearance of five-year-old Melissa Brannon appears to be focusing on one primary suspect. Police will continue their search efforts and to pursue leads. There is now a $10,000 reward for any information concerning Melissa's whereabouts. For Tammy Brannon and her parents, the hours passed in an agonizing wait for more information.
Melissa's disappearance electrified the tiny rural community of Lorton, a suburb of Washington, D.C. Only five months earlier, 10-year-old Rosie Gordon had been bike riding in her neighborhood when she was abducted, raped, and murdered. Her killer had never been found. Rosie's mother quickly came to Tammy Brennan's support. The yellow ribbons that punctuate trees and balconies at the Woodside apartment complex in Lorton have weathered Once Melissa's disappearance was reported on the news, the community rushed to her support. To yellow ribbons began appearing on Christmas Brandon. trees throughout the area. Uh, by all indications, Tammy was a wonderful mother, a very loving mother, very, very protective of her child. Melissa was her only child, and I, I just think all those facts together struck a chord that virtually anyone could identify with those circumstances, and, and people's hearts went out to the, to the Brannon family. Hundreds of people volunteered to post flyers throughout the region and assist the local authorities in their search. A new expert was also brought into the search effort. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children sent John Goad, one of their search and rescue consultants. And we are uh, legislated into being as the state clearinghouse for all the information regarding missing persons. And we also assist families and law enforcement, kind of as a liaison between the two, uh, working as many cases as we can. After debriefing, Goad and his partner went directly to the apartment complex clubhouse. Check a stride out here. Outside, they found adult male footprints leading from the furnace room window to a split rail fence whose top rail had recently been broken. We began to find transferences on the other side of the fence into a small parking lot there beside the clubhouse uh, in the parking lot, I think with an abandoned restaurant or some type of building there. And that's where the track stopped. Straight through here, over this fence. Right from the beginning, we found the adult footprints, but we never found the child's footprints. So we felt comfortable that if that was the abductor we were looking for, and we felt pretty comfortable that it was, that Melissa was probably being carried even from out, outside the window, was being carried by the abductor to the point where she, she and the abductor got in the vehicle. But no, where would Hughes have taken her? I don't know. Detectives received a lucky break when they interviewed Hughes' wife. To come in. She had been somewhat suspicious that he might go somewhere else after work. She didn't want him to go anywhere except to work and directly back home. And so unbeknownst to him, she had made a note of what the mileage was. And the following day told us that she had checked the mileage again and that 12 miles had been put on the car. We now had a p another piece of possible information about the extent to which okay, he could have gone that hours? night. We first marked the location of the crime. This was the apartment complex in southern Fairfax County. We next located Caleb Hughes's residence, which was in northern Prince William County, roughly in this area. We then took a string that was the equivalent of 12 linear miles and tied the two ends of the string together and placed them over the pins. So we simply took a pencil and defined that area so that any point at the end of that string represented the outer limits of the search that was conducted on December the 8th. Within three days of Melissa Brannon's disappearance, investigators had organized a 25 square mile joint search with the Army, Police Department, Civil Air Patrol, and Coast Guard. Over 500 volunteers turned out for the effort. We have a 12 mile radius that we need to cover. We had dozens of search teams that were comprised of trained law enforcement people, civilian volunteers, and military personnel. They were doing step-by-step -step searches of defined areas. Each area had been broken down and was assigned to a team. We're going to be looking for the clothing a lot. That's going to be one of the main things. They had specific instructions on how to search. If they found anything which they thought might be evidence, they were to mark it, uh, not to disturb it. And we had teams of crime scene people who would then respond to that particular location and process the evidence. At this point, we've not found anything today 
that puts us any closer than we were this morning. The volunteers were frustrated and extremely disappointed. I know there were nights when I would go home and my family would have seen a newscast about another day of searching and my own children would say, Daddy, are you, are you going to find that little girl? When are you going to find that little girl? And, and I think that was a conversation that was occurring in the homes of dozens of investigators and police officers involved in this case. While the search continued, Gogan approached the nearby FBI lab with the evidence he had processed from the car. Because Melissa was still missing, the FBI's state-of-the-art technology would be critical in establishing the connection between the hair, fibers, and bloodstains collected and Hello, Melissa Brannon. Agent Doug Diedrich of the FBI's Trace Evidence Unit would examine the evidence. Perhaps he could find a link to Melissa Brannon. There, you have to go to extraordinary measures to try to recreate, if at all possible, the environment of the victim, the most recent environment, and also the types of hairs that the victim may have, the type of clothing that the victim may have, uh, may have been wearing the night of the disappearance. And that's, that's the difficult part. As long as Melissa was still missing, filing charges against Caleb Hughes was all but impossible unless compelling evidence could be found. Diedrich and the lab examiners were impressed by the large number of fibers that had transferred onto the passenger seat of Hughes's car. Fairfax County investigators had identified nearly 70 different fibers. That included the, the blue acrylic fibers, the red cotton fibers, the black rabbit hairs, and, and there were, uh, I believe, uh, one or two head hairs in the case. But that's monumental. Sounds like a small number. That's huge. Once the FBI entered the case, its agents conducted their own investigation of Hughes's house. When Caleb Hughes's name was released as the primary and only suspect in the case, a media frenzy followed. Hughes has not been charged in the case, but he is the target of round-the-clock surveillance by the FBI. Federal investigators working with police from Fairfax County last night executed a search warrant on the groundskeeper's rented townhouse. They recovered several items which have been taken to the FBI laboratory to be tested to see if there is any evidence linking this man to Melissa. In the meantime, the FBI's official comment is no comment. The FBI brought the power of a federal grand jury to the investigation. The grand jury ordered Hughes to submit to blood and other forensic tests, something the local authorities had not been able to order. Hughes complained bitterly in interviews that his life had been ruined by the invasion. Details of a troubled past emerged. Hughes grew up in an abusive, dysfunctional home. He had a record as a juvenile delinquent, a long history of drug and alcohol abuse, and a disturbing attraction toward children. As an adult, he had been convicted of larceny. He had been convicted of car theft. Um, he had been convicted of contributing to the delinquency of a minor. The evidence indicated that he did spend a, uh, a lot of time with young children, nobody the age of, of Melissa Brannon, but certainly a, a, a lot of children in their early teens. In the lab, FBI examiners had begun analyzing the stains on the soles of Hughes's shoes. Though luminol testing had damaged the samples taken from Hughes's car, they became increasingly convinced that these minute traces contained blood serum proteins that could determine the crucial connection to Melissa. This blood's been this the samples were submitted for DNA and serology tests. Fifteen days after Melissa's abduction, a candlelight vigil for Melissa was held at the apartment complex. The little girl's disappearance had united the Fairfax community in compassion and outrage. Uh, 
and during that whole Christmas season of 1989, that every night on the six o'clock news, she saw uh, the video shot that her grandfather had taken of, of Melissa Brannon. And I'm, I'm sure I was like many, many people in the metropolitan area of Washington who felt that they knew her and from seeing this lovely child every night on television. But shortly after New Year's, a judge in the next county received a letter from Hughes's probation officer informing him that Hughes had violated probation for an auto theft conviction two years earlier. On January 24th, the judge revoked Hughes's probation and he was finally put behind bars. The earliest he could be released was November, giving the Fairfax County prosecutor ample time to build his case. Without sufficient evidence to file charges, Hughes had remained free. But now, with Hughes safely put away, the FBI had the time needed for the extensive testing required by the trace evidence. There was still a chance Melissa's body might be found. But without it, the case against Hughes would have to be made in the FBI lab. Already, FBI examiner Doug Diedrich had found his first big break in the case. I remembered some black animal hairs in the debris from the front seats of the car. And in looking through the little girl's nightshirt, I noticed these similar black hairs sticking out of, out of the nightshirt. So it just rang a bell. I went back, mounted those up on slides and compared them, and sure enough, dyed rabbit hair and they matched each other. The rabbit hairs from Hughes's car and those found on Melissa's nightgown both revealed a distinctive corncob texturing, an exact microscopic match. Agent Diedrich immediately called the prosecutor to determine whether Tammy Brannon owned a rabbit fur coat. Not only was it confirmed that Tammy Brannon owned a rabbit fur coat, she had worn it to the Christmas party. Her mother had bought it in Germany, and it was dyed an extremely rare bluish-black color almost unknown in the United States. Melissa had handled the coat at the party and at home. Diedrich had made the crucial connection between Melissa and the car of Caleb Hughes. So you not only you tied those rabbit hairs, you tied that match not only to the fur coat of her mother, you tied it to the front seat of the car, but you also tied it to the child's environment itself, uh, the rabbit hairs on the, on the shirt of the child. To me, I, that was a significant point in the case, because then it starts pushing me in the direction of, we might have something. And, and from there, it was a matter of digging some more, to see if I couldn't find some additional fibers that may be of value. So I started digging a little bit more, started looking a little closer, asking questions of myself, asking questions of the evidence, because it's speaking. Strange, but it's speaking to me. As week after week passed, Melissa's name eventually disappeared from the news. Life in Fairfax County had returned to normal, but Tammy Brannon was still no closer to finding her child. All right. All right. It's tremendously difficult for the family to come to terms with everything that that has gone on to come to terms with, we're still trying to hold on to that glimmer of hope that their child's alive. And then the realization that in all likelihood, you know, they may never find their child alive or may never find the body of their child, even after they've been murdered. Tammy was forced to face the reality that by now, there was almost no chance Melissa could still be alive. How did you do it? We wanted to close this case and, and not just close the case in the sense of identifying and prosecuting a suspect, but we wanted to bring real closure to the case in answering the question, what happened to Melissa Brandon that night? Why did it happen? Such questions plagued Tammy Brandon. Depressed and unable to work, she remained secluded in her apartment, waiting. Agent Diedrich had examined the blue acrylic and red cotton fibers in the passenger seat evidence collected by Jim Gogan. At first glance, they appeared to match descriptions he had been given of the red tights and big bird sweater Melissa wore that night. 
But without a duplicate outfit to make an exact fiber comparison, he was at a dead end. And so I went home, spoke to my wife. Of course, she straightened me out right away that if it had a big bird on it, it wasn't Winnie the Pooh, and it had to be sold to J.C. Penney's, having young kids of my own about the same age. Diedrich asked his wife if she kept any old J.C. Penney catalogs in the house from the last few years. She said she knew she had a Christmas catalog. Excuse me about being a pack rat. Diedrich was astonished to find a picture of an outfit that exactly matched the description of that worn by Melissa. The FBI contacted J.C. Penney, and the store began a search of its records. For more than two months, Tammy Brennan had anxiously waited by the phone for some kind of information or word about her daughter. Where is she? Then, completely unexpectedly, she received a phone call. A man's voice told her he was holding okay? Melissa for ransom and that she must deliver $75,000 the next day yes. or her little girl would be seriously hurt. Can I talk to her? Had Melissa been found? Yes. Yes. The national statistics will tell you that a child who's abducted by a stranger is usually dead within three hours of the abduction. So the likelihood of Melissa being alive months after the abduction, extremely slim. Mom, they have Melissa. Tammy immediately called her mother, who. but Detective Wilden cautioned them not to let their hopes get too high. No, no, don't, don't call anyone. I'll tell you all about it. Just come over right now. Once again, Melissa Brannon was okay. about to become front page news. Detective Wilden had instructed Tammy Brennan to cooperate with the ransom demands in the hopes her daughter would be recovered alive. As extortion falls under federal guidelines, the FBI coordinated the ransom drop. The FBI SWAT team was ready when two young men showed up in the parking lot to pick up the money. I see him getting ready to open up the door. He got the bag. Go. Here we go. They were quickly arrested. But did they have Melissa in their possession? The information provided in the ransom call was so vague and so generalized, it's entirely possible that the, the, the person who called <clears throat> may have picked up that information simply by watching the news or reading the newspaper. Uh, usually if there's a ransom demand that is legitimate, they're gonna have very specific information that would be known only to the abductor and probably some of the investigators. The two arrested youths were former students and roommates from a nearby university who had seen an opportunity to make some easy money out of Tammy Brennan's tragedy. They were convicted of five counts, including conspiracy and extortion, in the United States District Court in Alexandria, Virginia. It turned out to be just a terrible hoax. I mean, just terrible. The, the notion that you would do that deliberately uh, to the, a mother who was going through what she was going through. There were copious amounts of dog hairs in the tape samples collected by Fairfax County crime scene investigator Jim Gogan, as well as dozens of human hairs. FBI lab examiners separated and painstakingly subjected each one to testing. Finally, a hair was found that was different from the others. The hair was a very light blonde, the only one of its type found in the vehicle but it was an exact match with the hairs found in Melissa's hairbrush. Matching the human hair with Melissa was the second big match for Diedrich. But the critical link of Melissa's clothes to the fibers from Hughes's car was incomplete without a duplicate Big Bird outfit to analyze. Because it had been a special Christmas outfit, produced only once, it could not be found in stock. J.C. Penney gave the FBI a list of people who had purchased the outfit from its catalog division. They then sent FBI agents out across the country to locate those people 
and determine if they still had the Big Bird outfit that they had bought from the J.C. Penney catalog, and ultimately they were able to locate a sample outfit from a, a family that still had the outfit. Obtaining the outfit could mean the difference between conviction and acquittal in the case. The FBI asked the family traced through the J.C. Penney records to send it to their crime lab. Well, I remember that day pretty clearly. I, I knew the outfit was coming in. The fiber color, according to the color in the catalog, was navy blue. But the fibers that I was finding were sort of purplish blue. So I was a little anxious that maybe this wasn't the same outfit, that maybe we were going the wrong direction. So when that package came, I was, again, un, un, you know, uncomfortable with even opening it because I, was, I, w I thought I was on the right track, but I didn't, I didn't want to be wrong. I opened up the box, and sure enough, it had a purplish coloration to it. So it, it kind of gave me a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling there that I might have the right color anyway. Fibers were pulled from the red cotton skirt and the blue acrylic sweater. A thorough analysis of the fibers from the outfit indicated an identical match with the fibers from Hughes's car. From the red cotton threads to the blue acrylic yarns to the yellow cross threads from the plaid skirt, the duplicate Big Bird outfit matched in every respect with the car fibers. What I was finding was meaningful evidence that an abduction had taken place, that in fact the victim uh, in all likelihood had been in the front seat of the subject's car. With the new evidence, the prosecution could now piece together the actions of Caleb Hughes on the night Melissa disappeared. At the party, Hughes had tried to pick up several adult women, but when they rejected him, he sought a substitute. Fueled by frustration and alcohol, Caleb Hughes became a desperate predator with a perverse desire. His stalking eye fell upon the children. He waited and watched until an opportunity presented itself. When it did, Caleb Hughes seized an innocent and trusting child. Hey, Melissa. Hey. Remember me? By abducting Melissa Brennan, Hughes had crossed the boundary into the unspeakable. We had The analysis of the duplicate Big Bird outfit produced compelling evidence. It would be a powerful tool in the case against a man who investigators felt was a ruthless child molester and murderer. But Agent Diedrich had to convince the jury how incredibly unlikely it would be that these fibers had come from any source other than Melissa's outfit. He began asking people at the FBI to give him any items they may have made of navy blue acrylic. He collected more than a hundred. And the ob objective was to see, do the fibers that I found in the front seat of Cal Hughes' car, do they match any of these? The answer was no. From the items, Diedrich collected 126 different acrylic fibers. He made 7,983 comparison tests with those fibers against the ones found in Hughes' car. Out of almost 8,000 tests, only one succeeded in making an exact microscopic match with the blue acrylic fibers found in Hughes' car. And that was the duplicate Big Bird outfit. Whenever you match two things, it has a lot of significance. These aren't random events. These, in most cases, occur. Is it possible? You can't deny the possibility that it could be a coincidence. But after looking at this stuff for a lot of years, 
I'm not a big believer in coincidence. Three weeks before the trial was scheduled to begin, as investigators made final preparations for the case, a stunning development occurred. They received a phone call. Two counties away, police had just found the body of a child on the median strip of Interstate 95. I'll be right there. I called Wilden. We got in his car, and there was absolutely no doubt in my mind that, um, that that's, that was going to be it because Hughes uh, knew that area, spent time down in that area. I said, wow, this, this is going to be it. That section of median on I-95 is wide and densely wooded. It would have been easy for Hughes to pull over, hide the body among the thick vegetation, and drive off unnoticed, and there would be little chance of someone finding the remains. But someone found a body. Was it Melissa's? If it was Melissa Brannon's body in the highway median, Fairfax County Commonwealth Attorney Robert Horan felt he could put Hughes behind bars on murder one charges. His hopes were high, but they were soon dashed. As soon as we got there, as soon as I saw it, I knew it wasn't Melissa Brannon. It could, the skeleton had rings on three fingers, uh, but it was a young girl. She's. Um, 13, 12, 13, 14 year old um, who had been in that media for two growing seasons. The young girl's body was never identified. Finally, nearly one year after Melissa's disappearance, Hughes was arrested on a grand jury indictment for abducting Melissa Brannon. He was transferred from the Prince William County Jail to the Fairfax County Jail. Moran had delayed the indictment for several months in the hope that Melissa's body would be found. Uh, by then, uh, I know we were all pretty satisfied that the worst had happened to the child. Uh, unfortunately, under Virginia law, uh, you can charge somebody with murder uh, without the body, but you have to be able to prove where the murder occurred. And of course, without the body in this case, um, we had no way of proving where it occurred, so we couldn't charge him with murder. Abduction with intent to defile was the strongest case that could be brought against him. Hughes pleaded not guilty. Few people in Fairfax County believe that Melissa could still be alive. But everyone, most of all Tammy Brannon, needed to know what had happened and needed to see justice served. Because it's tremendously important that the family of that child had definitive answers, that they know what happened to their child, even if the news is not pleasant. They need to understand exactly with concrete information what happened to their child. They need to be able to have a closure. They need to be able to, to give that child the burial that they deserve and go on with their lives. With Agent Diedrich's airtight analysis of the trace evidence, Robert Horan went into the trial confident that he could convince the jury beyond reasonable doubt. The trial began on February 26, 1991. Good. A chief part of Horan's strategy is depicting Hughes' deviant sexual behavior at the party. He produced several female witnesses who recalled the crude, vulgar sexual propositions he had made to them, and others who testified he had spent considerable time playing with Melissa and had been talking to her just before she disappeared. His behavior was even more extreme, trying to eliminate the evidence. Washing his clothes, his leather belt, his shoes. He could not account for the fresh cuts on the soles of his shoes. Nor could he account for his whereabouts for the two and a half hours between leaving the party and arriving home. But the problem for the defense is somehow you had to explain that time. And, and, and there was never an explanation. I mean, it would have gutted our case. Our case is over if you can explain any of that time. 
Though tests for blood on the shoes had proved inconclusive, the prosecution was now able to show the jury the exact matches made between the rabbit hairs, the head hair, and the fibers found in Hughes's car. Nonetheless, the defense argued that all of the fiber and hair evidence was purely circumstantial. It may be circumstantial, but it is powerful circumstantial evidence because it doesn't change. In order to obtain the maximum sentence for Hughes, Moran needed to convince the jury that Hughes had intended to defile Melissa once he had her in his car. And the only way the fibers from her outfit would have been found on the seat is that her, car, her coat had been removed while she was in that car. The prosecution charged that Hughes could only have removed Melissa's coat for one purpose, an attempt to defile. The true answer is that that five-year-old was seated against her will in the front seat of that vehicle. Caleb Hughes's trial lasted eight days. After nine hours of deliberation, the jury found him guilty of abducting Melissa Brannan with intent to defile. He was sentenced to 50 years in prison. For the family members, it can't end because of the eternal hope, if you will, that someday this child that's never been seen, never been found, this child someday will, will appear. And that's, that's hard stuff. That is hard stuff. Caleb Hughes is still serving his sentence today, and the body of Melissa Brannan has never been found. Eventually, Tammy Brannan moved from the Woodside apartment complex, but she never changed the telephone number that Melissa had memorized by heart, hoping that one day a call might come. The sunshine and beaches of South Florida attract many types of people. Aspiring young models gravitate here with the hopes of being discovered. Beginning in February 1984, the dreams of stardom darkened into nightmares when several young women disappeared. It was the beginning of a string of brutal and terrifying murders that spread out across the country. It's a model's job to rivet the public's attention. But in 1984, some aspiring models began attracting publicity in a terrible new way. Across the country, dreams of glamour turned nightmarish as young women disappeared, only to be found tortured and killed. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. When a suspect emerged, the FBI's 10 most wanted list became the tool we used to try to flush him out. The promising life of Beth Kenyon came to a violent end on March 5, 1984. The attractive 23-year-old dreamed of becoming a model. She had even been a finalist in the Miss Florida pageant. But all her hopes were cut short this Monday afternoon. Next day, Beth's parents reported her disappearance to the Miami police. The police merely listed Beth as a missing person and explained many girls her age drop out of sight for various reasons without telling their parents. But the Kenyans knew their daughter wasn't the type to just vanish after a few days on a lark. They hired private detective Ken Whitaker and his son Ken Jr. to investigate. She's been missing 
The Kenyans told the Whitakers that Beth worked as a teacher of emotionally disturbed children. She has a regular routine that she comes home. She was responsible and enjoyed a close relationship with her family. This is, as you can see, where she had a six o'clock appointment. Fearing something had happened to Beth, the Kenyans had searched their daughter's apartment in North Dade County for anything that might help them find her. But all they found was an address book and a picture album. Armed with little more than a few snapshots of Beth and her friends, the investigators went to work. The father and son team quickly narrowed down Beth Kenyon's last known whereabouts. Ken Whitaker Jr. talked to an attendant at the Miami gas station near the school where Beth taught. Ken showed the attendant several photographs. He clearly remembered Beth, but he also recognized someone else in the photos, a man that accompanied Beth the afternoon she disappeared. His name was Christopher White. On March 11th, six days after Beth's disappearance, the investigators contacted Wilder by phone. He denied knowing where Beth was, but invited the Whitakers to his house to speak more about her. But when Wilder didn't answer his door, the suspicious investigators decided to look around. They had learned he was a successful building contractor and a self-proclaimed fashion photographer. The Kenyans had told the father and son team that Wilder had proposed to their daughter, but that she had turned him down, leaving him upset and angry. Rifling through the garbage, the Whitakers found a photograph. Chris Wilder. On the surface, it appeared an innocent picture, but to trained eyes, it meant more. Investigators soon learned that Christopher Wilder had driven a car in the Miami Grand Prix. On February 26, 1984, he finished 17th and won $400. That race day was also the last time that anyone saw Rosario Gonzalez. The 20-year-old worked for a marketing firm distributing free aspirin samples at the Grand Prix. The Miami News still buzzed with the mysterious disappearance of Gonzalez. She had vanished just five days before Beth Kenyon. The investigators discovered that Wilder knew Gonzalez. She had modeled for him in amateur photo shoots. It was a critical connection. The two missing women, Beth Kenyon and Rosario Gonzalez, were linked through Christopher Wilder. With this information, Mr. and Mrs. Kenyon sought the help of the FBI. Special Agent John Hanlon of the FBI's Violent Crimes Unit in Miami remembers the meeting. On the 12th of March, the Kenyons came to the FBI uh, seeking more active involvement of the FBI. Of course, we didn't have any jurisdiction at the time. There was no evidence of an abduction. In an attempt to put pressure on Wilder, the Kenyans' private investigators leaked their findings to the Miami Herald. The story was published on March 16, 1984. Though the article did not mention Christopher Wilder's name, it clearly accused him. The report described the man connecting Gonzalez and Kenyon as a local contractor, race car driver, amateur photographer, and a native Australian. It was Wilder to a T. Although the FBI had no jurisdiction, Supervisory Special Agent Gordon McNeil had already begun looking into the matter. This connection uh, drew my interest, and uh, I decided to uh, open a preliminary kidnapping investigation to see if we had a possible violation of federal law. Agents McNeil and Hanlon found Wilder was a likely suspect. He had a criminal history that reached back to his native Australia, where he was out on bail on a sexual assault charge. Days later, on March 21st, 
the agents were notified about an incident which allowed them to open a full investigation. A phone call came into the Miami FBI office reporting that a Tallahassee, Florida woman had been abducted and transported across state lines into Georgia, where she escaped. The initial description of her assailant fit Christopher Wilder. Are you okay? Special Agent Hanlon flew to Georgia to hear the victim's story. It was a nightmare. Nineteen-year-old Linda Grober told Hanlon she'd been shopping in a mall in Tallahassee, Florida, when a man approached her about a modeling job. Magazine covers? I got any number of them. And it really sounds like Claiming to be a photographer, the stranger invited her back to his car to see his portfolio. It was the middle of the afternoon in a very public place, and Linda said she felt perfectly safe. Never? When he asked her if she'd ever modeled, she said no. He flattered her with remarks about how beautiful she was and promised he could put her on the cover of Vogue. But Linda reported that when they got to his car, the photographer began changing his story. He claimed he'd left his portfolio at his studio and he asked Linda to go back to the studio with him. When she hesitated, the man attacked and pushed her into the car. He clubbed her on the back of her head. Everything just went black. When she regained consciousness, they were driving on a country road. When her abductor saw her coming around, he stopped the car in a secluded spot. He dragged Linda from the car, telling her that if she tried to escape, he would kill her. He wrapped his fingers around her throat and strangled her until she passed out. The next time she woke up, she was wrapped in a sleeping bag, lying on a bed in a cheap motel room. Once again, he threatened to kill her if she tried to escape. Don't move. He tied her to the bed and super glued her eyes shut. For the next several hours, the kidnapper repeatedly raped, beat, and tortured Linda Grober. When she disobeyed his commands, he shocked her with an extension cord he had fashioned into an electrocution device. Anytime the abuse was so severe, Linda realized she would be dead before someone found her. She managed to break free and locked herself in the bathroom. Somebody help! help she pounded somebody on the walls and screamed for help. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Hey! Stop now! Stop it! Stop it! I'm telling you. The rapist panicked, grabbed what he could, and ran. Agent Hanlon showed Grober a series of photos and asked if she could identify her assailant. It was absolutely no doubt in my mind. I mean, I'd spent hours with this person that that's who he was. And I just identified him as clearly Christopher Wilder. Now 35, a PhD candidate and a single mom, Linda Grober's fierce determination saved her life. 
It also made her a strong witness, ready to risk everything for her abuser's arrest. I was in the hospital for a week or something like that, and then I was, I had to basically leave the country while he was still a fugitive because they were concerned about my safety. They were concerned about my family's safety. As heinous as Grover's ordeal was, it had the value of catapulting the investigation into a federal case. Because she had been abducted across a state line, the FBI now had full jurisdiction. Christopher Wilder was now wanted for the kidnapping and rape of Linda Grover. And he remained the prime suspect in the disappearance of Rosario Gonzalez and Beth Kenyon. Uh, obviously now we had a uh, federal violation and we had every reason to put all the resources of the FBI into this case. Not knowing exactly where to find Wilder, a team of agents descended upon his house in full force. Kicking in the door, they poured in, ready to arrest the suspect. Clear. 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 But they found an empty house. All clear. All clear. Wilder had long abandoned it. All clear. He was on the run, days ahead of the federal agents. And every minute he remained free, put another woman in jeopardy. The desperate chase had begun. March 1984, FBI agents conducted a meticulous search of the abandoned home belonging to Christopher Wilder. Two women were missing and presumed dead at his hands. A third had barely escaped with her life after her kidnapping and rape. The agents needed something to clue them in to their suspect's present whereabouts. You like to decorate it, huh? What happened to his maid? But before he left, Wilder had prepared his home for any investigator. The place had been manicured. There were basically no fingerprints left in Wilder's house. You're always going to find fingerprints inside a residence. It looked like everything had been totally cleaned. FBI and local authorities canvassed Miami and West Palm Beach. But no one reported having seen or heard from Wilder since he left Linda Grober in a Georgia motel. The FBI alerted police to keep an eye out for Wilder's car. They asked banks and credit card companies to monitor any transactions he might make. But informational systems in 1984 moved slowly. The leads trickled in and were usually too late for a quick response. On March 21st, 1984, a sharp-eyed utility repairman in central Florida noticed something unusual in a shallow creek. It was the barely recognizable body of a young woman. She was later identified as 21-year-old Teresa Ferguson. Witnesses last saw her three days earlier, leaving a shopping mall with a man fitting Wilder's description. The autopsy showed she'd been beaten with a tire iron and strangled to death. The victim's profile and the savagery of the crime suggested Wilder. But nothing directly tied him to it. If it was the Australian contractor, the FBI agents knew they had a serial killer on the loose one that had to be stopped before he murdered again. Agents continued to follow the suspect's trail. An automatic security camera photographed Wilder at a bank in Tampa. The bank records showed that he had emptied his accounts of more than $19,000. It was an ominous break. Their prey now had the money to travel far and wide. By March 22, 1984, 
Wilder was already in Texas. Witnesses saw him approach 23-year-old Terry Walden in the parking lot of Lamar University in Beaumont, Texas. Walden was a wife, mother of two, and a nursing student. Yes, I'm a photographer. My job is to nurse. Wilder asked her if she'd like to do some modeling. Make a lot of extra money. You sure you don't want to keep it so I can think about it? But Wilder couldn't seduce Walden with his pitch. She politely declined. She had no way of knowing that she would soon see him again. While the FBI began its national hunt, witnesses later told investigators that Wilder had stayed in Beaumont, Texas another day. This time he went back to familiar territory to stalk his next victim. They have this one since 799 or 99. He visited the local mall shopping for a young woman to deceive with dreams of glamour. You're taking some fashion photography? No, uh, no, no, listen. You don't no, have to sorry. run. No. I'm legit. It's okay. But no one succumbed to his bogus no. promises. No, sorry. That's fine. That's fine. After getting brushed off several times, he spotted a familiar face. It was Terry Walton. Hey. She had come to run errands after dropping her four-year-old daughter off at daycare. Are you interested now? Will you take the card and just consider? Terry again turned Wilder down. I'm sure you could. But this time, he wouldn't take no for an answer. As she left the mall, Wilder followed her out to her car. In broad daylight, in the middle of a crowded mall parking lot, Wilder attacked Walter. He knocked her unconscious and pushed her into her Mercury Cougar. He grabbed his bags and drove off in the victim's car. Walden's husband reported her missing later that afternoon when she failed to pick up her daughter at daycare. But by then, it was too late. Terry Walden's body was found floating in a canal near Beaumont, Texas, a few days later. The police recovered Wilder's Chrysler a few miles away. An FBI forensic search of the car uncovered hair and fibers matching Teresa Ferguson, the young woman discovered by the repairman five days before. It confirmed what the agents had suspected all along. Teresa Ferguson had been Wilder's fourth known victim. McNeil and Hammond estimated that the killer was still at least two days ahead of them. Out of the Miami office, they broadcast a national all-points bulletin for Terry Walden's stolen car. Uh, every state police agency along the way, every state trooper who was out on that highway knew the car we were looking for. And unfortunately, uh, it's amazing sometimes you say, okay, well, he's in a purple car. We say, how many purple cars are out there? Well, it's amazing how many purple cars are out there when you're looking for purple cars. And that was the problem. We never knew at the time what license plate he was using on that particular vehicle. FBI teletypes clattered endlessly. Every field office in the country received page after page describing Wilder's physical appearance, his victim profiles, where he had last been identified, and where he was thought to be heading. The technology of 1984, however, could not keep up with the pace of his flight.
There were so many leads on Wilder going back and forth all over the country. Every one of them went to all FBI offices for information that the FBI teletype system was backed up over 48 hours for about two weeks because of the volume of information that was flowing back and forth on Wilder. That left the Bureau with only one certain way to track Wilder. They had to follow the grisly trail of corpses he discarded as he ran. The next victim was 21-year-old Suzanne Logan. She was last seen shopping at a mall near Oklahoma City. A fisherman stumbled upon her body two days after she disappeared. The location of her disappearance and the manner in which she died all suggested one thing. She had died at the hands of Christopher Wilder. In this particular case, we had an individual who was kidnapping, raping, torturing, and murdering a woman about every day and a half. So uh, uh, there was intense pressure, as there should be. Slow technology and a fast fugitive hampered the FBI. But on March 28th, they got the break they had hoped for. Wilder checked into a motel in Rifle, Colorado, using a stolen Visa card. The FBI knew he had the card and was using it, but they had not been able to trace it until Rifle. In those days, 1984, they didn't have the uh, instant validation of your credit card when you walk into a hotel. They only called in uh, bills that were going to exceed $100. Uh, every motel that Wilder stayed along his murderous route, the charges were in the vicinity of $50 to $60. Perhaps from sheer boredom, the motel clerk decided to call in the credit card that night instead of waiting to mail it the next day. Instead of approval, the clerk received a phone number to call immediately. An early morning call mobilized the FBI's Denver, Colorado field office. At last, the FBI knew where the fugitive was. Colorado, yeah. In the early hours of the morning of March 29th, four agents approached Wilder's motel room, confident that they had finally cornered the killer. Okay. FBI, search warrant! Go! FBI! He wasn't there. As swiftly as the FBI had responded, Wilder had eluded them. For some unknown reason, the fugitive had departed yeah, before sunrise. He's not in the hotel. It had been the best lead the agency had, and it failed. Once again, the exasperated task force had no idea of where the predator was. Yet they feared it was one of the dozens of shopping malls within a day's drive of Rifle, Colorado. March 29, 1984. In just three weeks, the Australian contractor Christopher Wilder had abducted four women and murdered three of them. FBI agents noticed a pattern developing in the campaign of violence. The killer kept his direction westward, and he had narrowed his hunting grounds to shopping malls. Eighteen-year-old Cheryl Bonaventura was last seen at the Mesa Shopping Mall in Grand Junction, Colorado. The FBI would later connect Wilder to her death. You had a man that you knew was on the prowl. You had a man who you knew as each day goes by that, that some poor soul in deathly fear of her life was dying in an extremely uh, uh, dangerous, extremely painful way. 
To get the word out, the FBI cast a wide net. Across the country, agents notified security officers and mall managers about the danger, telling them to be on the lookout for the Australian. Investigators supplied malls with photos and flyers that were posted to alert shoppers. Despite the FBI warnings, a teen magazine held a cover girl competition at the Meadows Mall in Las Vegas. Wilder showed up, armed with his camera. He chatted with several of the teams during the event, but eventually zeroed in on Michelle Korfman. The 17-year-old had driven up the 25 miles from her family's Boulder City, Nevada home. Nervous about participating in her first model search, she had asked her friends and family to let her go alone. After a few minutes' conversation with Wilder, Korfman changed her clothes and left the mall with him. Yeah, sure, I do. It was April 1st. As soon as Vegas authorities alerted the FBI that a local girl had disappeared at a mall, agents responded. They asked for all pictures that anyone had taken of the fashion show. One photographer immediately delivered five rolls of film. And when they printed those photographs, there was the Korfman girl on stage in a modeling type pose and who's directly beyond her about 20 feet away looking at her with what I call the look of a homicidal maniac, none other than Christopher Wilder. Like the others, young Michelle Korfman suffered at the hands of Wilder. He bound and gagged her with duct tape. Then he beat, raped, and tortured her. And you will see incisions in the body. Uh, they may only be an inch to an inch and a half long, and they're not deep. They're done just enough to make it bleed. They were only meant to torture, not to kill, until he finally actually killed the victims. He was a brutal, sexual sadist. On April 5th, four days after the Michelle Korfman disappearance, the FBI held a press conference. They announced the placement of Christopher Wilder on its famed 10 most wanted fugitives list. For 50 years, the list has helped generate the publicity needed to catch violent fugitives. Hey, Special Agent Tron Brecky serves as national spokesman for the FBI. Okay. Thank you. The criteria for the top 10 was met with Wilder. He was a menace to society, he was extremely dangerous, a violent individual on whom charges were outstanding, and he had fled the area where we thought that he might be. Therefore, it was very important for us to get the message out to the American public and to the media that uh, he could be anywhere in the United States. But Wilder's addition to the 10 most wanted fugitives list came a day too late for Tina Marie Resico. In Lomita, California, on the day before the press conference, the 16-year-old visited the Del Amo Fashion Center Mall to apply for a summer notice. job. What a beautiful face. The high school student wanted the work to save for a car. She met Christopher Wilder when he said that she was perfect for a modeling gig he had to shoot. And, uh, actually, you're so perfect that I could give you $100 right here. He gave her $100 cash and promised much more to come. If you're right, and I know you are, I can tell you all. Do you have a few minutes to just go out and close the house? Take some pictures of her. Say to myself, this girl is perfect. Wilder drove Tina Marie to a nearby park. Mm -hmm. 
At first, everything progressed as if it were a legitimate job. He said the scenic location had perfect light for the camera. The canopy right here, I think, is really lovely. Right as the shoot began, an eager Tina Marie worked to please her photographer. When Wilder told her to smile, she did. When he told her to tilt her head, she did. And then it all turned wrong. Now, in the car, all right? He pointed a 357 Magnum at her face and told her to get in the car. Quickly, quickly. The terrified teen had no choice but to obey. Wilder brought Tina Marie Rosico to a motel in San Diego. There, like all the others, he beat his teenage victim, tied her to the bed, and raped her repeatedly. Wilder cut her with his knife and electrocuted her using wires he would tie to different parts of her body. The brutality perplexed Agent Hanlon. You say to yourself, why would anybody want to do that to anybody, to scare them so bad, to brutalize them so bad, to, to torture them with an electrical cord, and then kill them like a, a piece of trash? And that person knows they're going to be killed. I mean, up until some point, the great realization comes over that individual, I'm not going to survive this. My life's over. And these are young women. He identifies himself as a professional photographer, commenting on a young woman's appearance and attempts to persuade her to accompany him from the area. Just as Tina's life was about to end, a special news bulletin captured Wilder's attention. And this approach may lead to his apprehension. Christopher Bernard Wilder has been placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. As you know, we it was the FBI press conference. Wilder watched in horror as his picture was plastered on television sets across the nation. The federal agents proclaimed him the most wanted fugitive in America. They held him responsible for the disappearances of six young women. They didn't know about the seventh victim in the hotel room with him. We gotta move, come on! Wilder panicked. He grabbed Tina Marie and hit the road. Come on, we gotta move! But now that he was top on the 10 most wanted fugitives list, Wilder landed on the front page of every newspaper and on the top of every newscast in the country. It's the front page headline in every newspaper in America. Every news show, every radio show is talking about Christopher Wilder and showing his picture and saying his name, Christopher Wilder. The FBI hoped that by plastering Wilder's face across TV screens and newspapers, someone, somewhere, would spot him. It was the best chance agents had to stop Wilder before he destroyed another life. In the spring of 1984, the FBI conducted the largest manhunt in history for the rapist and murderer, Christopher Wilder. They knew of at least six victims, they suspected there were many more. Wilder had squeezed through the FBI net in Nevada as he headed back east. With him was a 16-year-old hostage named Tina Marie Rosico. On April 10, 1984, outside a shopping mall in Gary, Indiana, Christopher Wilder told Rosico that he would let her go on one condition. she had to help him catch his next victim. For six days, the adolescent had been raped, beaten, and terrorized. She was ready to do whatever he asked. Wilder noticed Dornette Wilt ducking into several shops. He figured she was job hunting in the mall.
Rosico told Donette that Wilder was a store manager and wanted her to fill out a job application at his car. When they reached his car, Wilder drew his pistol and forced Donette to get in. Sweetheart, why don't you just come with us? Get the car. Get in. Go around. Go around. He sped off with the two girls. Witnesses saw them leave. A young woman, uh, very attractive, as were all of Wilder's victims. Uh, had been taken from a, um, was seen leaving with an individual who they believed to be Crystal Wilder from a mall in the Indianapolis area. And so uh, when that information came to us, we felt that, okay, now we know he's headed back east. The Bureau directed every agent east of the Mississippi to work on the case. Despite his promise, Wilder refused to release Tina Marie. Instead, he forced Rosico to watch while he tortured and raped Donette in front of her. The nightmare continued for two days. On the morning of April 12, 1984, Tina Marie heard a familiar voice in the morning news. Any kind of energy and just put Tina come home alive safely. You know, we're all rooting for you. The word that we've got on national television. Tina Marie's mother begged the kidnapper not to hurt her daughter. Is your daughter, and that there is every indication that your daughter is still alive. And Wilder flew into another panic. He packed up his hostages get, 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 get and dressed. left. Get her dressed, and you get dressed now. Wilder complained that it was only a matter of time before the FBI caught up with him. He stopped the car in a wooded area near Penyan, New York. He ordered Rosico not to move. Donette was drugged with sleeping pills, yet he forced her to march into the forest. Left alone, Tina Marie pondered the opportunity to escape. But the horror of the last nine days had broken her mentally. She stayed put. Walking through the woods, Donette Wilt slowly woke up to the realization that Wilder was going to kill her. She didn't want to die by stabbing. She begged him to shoot her instead. Ignoring her pleas, Wilder stabbed her through the chest twice and left her for dead. Fear that Donette Wilt might still be alive seized him. He returned to the scene to properly dispose of Donette. Stay here. You stay here. You hear? When he got there, he could scarcely believe what he saw. She was gone. Incredibly, Donette Wilt had survived. Stabbed twice, bleeding profusely, drugged and beaten, she had managed to pull herself up and escape to a road where a passing motorist rescued her. Thanks to Wilt's testimony, the FBI now pinned Wilder in the Northeast, still driving the Mercury Cougar he had stolen from Terry Walden. But for how long? After he went back and found out that she was no longer there, 
uh, he realized obviously that uh, he had to do something uh, with this vehicle. He needed a new vehicle. And uh, he got into western New York State. Once again, he headed for the nearest mall. This time in Victor, New York, where he spotted a gold Pontiac Firebird. He told Rosico she would take the wheel of the Cougar and follow him wherever he went. He carjacked 33-year-old Beth Dodge. At gunpoint, Wilder forced her into the back seat of her Firebird. The emotionally shattered Tina Marie did as she was ordered. Wilder drove for a half an hour to a secluded area. Come on, come on, get out. Come on, just get out. Just get out. Just get out. Listen, I want you to get the white suitcase, and I want you to get the camera, and I want you to put it in this car and wait for me, you understand? forced Beth Dodge into the woods. Moments later, Tina Marie heard two shots echo out from the trees. There had been no rape, no torture this time. Wilder had simply killed Dodge for her car but he had a different fate in mind for Tina Marie. In all the hell he had put her through, Wilder had bonded with Tina Marie. He told her he didn't want her to be around when the end came. He drove Tina Marie Rosico to the airport in Boston and gave her money for a ticket home to Los Angeles. Her ordeal was finally over. Once safely home, Tina Marie would fill in details for agents about Wilder's murderous rampage. Wilder was now alone. And the agents didn't want to wait till another victim disappeared to clue them into his whereabouts. During the search for Wilder, we knew that, uh, that he had uh, friends uh, in Canada and had visited Canada extensively. So uh, we felt there was a good chance that he was heading directly to the east and then north into Canada. Wilder raced toward the border in Beth Dodge's Firebird. For three weeks, he had beaten the FBI's best efforts. Even the 10 most wanted fugitives list had failed to produce his capture. Agents McNeil and Hanlon desperately wanted to stop the killer before he struck again or fled their jurisdiction. By April 1984, Christopher Wilder had left seven women dead across America. Three more were presumed dead. Three others had survived with rapes and beatings. The FBI believed that he was in New England, heading north. Federal agents concentrated their resources in the northeastern states before he could escape across the Canadian border. I mean, the FBI had agents out circularizing in the wanted poster out and that kind of thing. But the best thing you have going for you are the hundreds of police officers up in that area who uh, are a lot, many more eyes and ears than FBI agents available in, in New England. On Friday, April 13th, 1984, Wilder stopped for gas in the tiny town of Colebrook, New Hampshire, about a dozen miles from the Canadian border. While he filled the tank, he casually asked an attendant about the paperwork that might be needed to cross the border. Two state troopers, Wayne Fortier and Leo Jellison, spotted Beth Dodge's car. They, like almost every police department in the country, had been told to be on the lookout for the Firebird and for a man of Wilder's description. Jellison asked Wilder if he could speak with him. Hey, buddy, can I go up for a second? Please, get out of the 
Wilder leaped into the Firebird and grabbed his 357 knife. In the struggle, the weapon went off. Officer Jellison was shot in the chest. He would live. But Christopher Wilder would not. The bullet that wounded Officer Jellison first passed through Wilder. It pierced his heart, killing him instantly. Wilder's cross-country reign of terror ended with a tenth death. His own. Authorities ultimately recovered the mutilated bodies of Cheryl Bonaventura and Michelle Korfman in the months afterwards. But the two missing women that started the investigation, Rosario Gonzalez and Beth Kenyon, were never found. Mr. and Mrs. Kenyon went to their graves without knowing the fate of their daughter. Other victims and their loved ones have struggled to restore their shattered lives. Are you my friend? <laughs> Linda Grober has also learned a chilling lesson. I think an important point to make is that these people are not always demons and they're not, they don't always have tattoos, they don't always have long hair, they're often extremely eloquent and they're, they're disguised and they can fit easily into your father's living room after dinner sipping a, a wine or a brandy. The terrifying truth is that Christopher Wilder was not unique. He made the most wanted fugitives list, but there are dozens of killers like him each year that never reach national attention. They trawl our shopping centers, our schools and our churches, searching for victims. Vivid dreams of easy fame and fortune can quickly darken. Only through public awareness, tireless vigilance, and the resourcefulness of the FBI can we hope to keep these predators at bay.